uh, good afternoon. We better get going. Uh, well, first of all, on behalf of uh, all my colleagues at uh, UCSF, I'd like to welcome you to our annual conference uh, on transplantation uh, in the beautiful uh, Napa Valley. Uh, I think in view of the complexity of uh, immunosuppressive uh, regimens, I think this type of conference uh, is very important, in particular in, in terms of uh, streamlining uh, the continuity of follow-up between us and you, the physicians of the patient, and basically, ultimately, uh, to make sure compliance of the drugs is there and we can hopefully in many ways improve long-term outcomes and this is the subject of going to be of many presentation basically how can we finally improve long-term outcome in transplantation we have a very nice uh, program today and uh, hopefully you'll find it both instructive and enjoyable <coughs> uh, so without any undue delay I'd like to introduce our chief of service John Roberts who every year gives you a state of the transplant of transplantation at UCSF and our outcome data. Well, good afternoon. It's nice to see a great turnout again. <coughs> um, first off, you know, I think we all owe uh, Flavio and more importantly Peggy Millar a hand and uh, organizing this because they do such a great job every year. <laughs> really is a spectacular thing how they get the weather right. <laughs> so I'd just also like to thank some of our other sponsors, Novartis, Genentech, uh, Bristol-Myers Squibb, Astellas, Amgen, Genzyme, Pfizer, QuestCore, Otsuka, and uh, Silex for their uh, continued support of the uh, program. And, <clears throat> and so I hope you'll visit their uh, tables outside. So we have had a pretty stable group now. Um, at least the surgeons have been very stable. We, we're all old and getting older. Nobody has left and, and uh, we haven't pushed anybody overboard. Everybody seems to be pretty happy with being a UCSF. <coughs> As you know, Steve and Flavio have been here forever. Um, <coughs> and uh, Brian Lee, uh, Allison Weber, and David Wachowski are our newest colleagues, and I think you've probably met um, them maybe this year or last year, but if you haven't, you ought to introduce themselves. They're all great young uh, people with a lot of energy and enthusiasm. <clears throat> In terms of our pre-transplant coordinators, <coughs> you know, we sort of break the coordinators out in areas of expertise. So we have our deceased donor uh, coordinators, Teresa, David, Linda, and, and uh, Maria Tong. Uh, in terms of the living donor coordinators, um, we have uh, Kelly, who just uh, joined us, uh, Diane, uh, <coughs> Sarah, and uh, Janine has moved over from uh, deceased donor to the living donor um, group uh, for evaluation. So when your patients first come to UCSF, they either meet uh, Sandra or Stephanie, and those that go to the outreach uh, clinics, um, Myra and Kelly are going to be their guides uh, to transplantation. In terms of the post-transplant clinic, uh, <coughs> Melanie and Brooke, uh, <coughs> Brooke just joined us uh, recently. Uh, Sue Robertson, who is in the post-transplant clini clinic, has moved over as a nurse practitioner in the inpatient side of things and joining Nancy Fong Ham, who's been doing a great job there. Uh, for pancreas, we have uh, Sally and the pediatric um, <coughs> uh, coordinators are uh, Marilyn and uh, Jessica, and you can introduce yourselves to them. Uh, Amy is in, uh, usually comes every year, but she was fortunate enough to go off to Italy and have a really nice time, better than nap, I guess. Uh, Melissa and Martha are, are in charge of both post and, and pre-transplant -clinic, pre clinic, respectively. We have our social workers, uh, Steve, Andrea, Julia, and, and Laura and Julie, and the financial counselors, uh, <coughs> Curtis, Roberto, uh, Rachel, <coughs> um, Lisa, Ann, Riley, and Regina, and just tell you how complex it the finances of kidney transplantation we got when we have to have almost as many financial counselors as we have nurse coordinators. One of the things we're really happy about is the Connie Frank Transplant Center. It's on the seventh floor. If you'd ever visited the transplant clinic before, it was on the third floor. We had 
a uh, donor, Connie, who uh, renovated this space for us, and it's really spectacular. It, it did a, the architects changed sort of the standard of, um, configuration of the building to give us more space and, and also a spectacular view. You can see the view in the, this is the clinic waiting area. It has an unbelievable view of San Francisco, the Golden Gate Bridge, and the bay. Um, <clears throat> these are the exam rooms outside and in, so they're, they're really nice, um, <clears throat> very nice uh, yeah, area with, uh, oh, they also have spectacular views, but do have privacy screens. And then we have a sort of a patient education slash conference room uh, that, you know, is also uh, really beautiful. So we're really grateful to, to Connie for that, uh, <coughs> allowing us to renovate that space. In terms of the number of kidney transplants, we had <coughs> some increase in the total number of transplants uh, this last year, uh, going from 328, sorry, th from 328 in 2009 to 366. Uh, this year, <coughs> um, our increases were both in uh, living donor and <coughs> um, cadaveric uh, transplant ended up being pretty evenly split in terms of the increase. Um, you can see that <coughs> we've also done the usual multi-organs include uh, pancreas kidney, liver kidney, heart kidney, and I, um, to give us a total number of uh, <coughs> transplants of something like uh, 9,674 last count. In terms of the pancreas uh, program, <coughs> we've uh, been, had a really st relatively stable volume of being uh, 26 and 27 with a total pr program number of 506. Our uh, survival rate results are then, again, <coughs> um, above expected for uh, both one and year and uh, three year survival <coughs> and both uh, patient and graft survival. So that we're continuing to do uh, well with our um, overall survival results. In terms of wait list activity, we um, had uh, a smaller growth, I think, in the past than we've had on that wait list. Um, part of this is that some of you know we've uh, been doing some more upfront screening of uh, patients. So if, if patients are smoking or uh, have uh, really significant obesity, we're not re uh, have seeing those patients in evaluation until they quit smoking our um, Lose, a, uh, lose the uh, weight that they need to uh, lose before we evaluate them because we'd find that they just, you know, continue to smoke and, and be heavy on the wait list. We're also doing uh, the paired donation. You know, this is sort of these swaps that you've heard about in the past where we, um, you know, trans we have patients that, that uh, shift kidneys between pairs. These have now led to multi-center pairs or, ch or ex multi-center exchanges. Um, called chains that, you know, you hear about in the uh, paper. These can be up to, you know, 20 or 30 uh, exchanges going in a row. The, um, we've uh, per we performed uh, 21 of these uh, paired exchanges, and I think Chris Fries is going to tell you more about uh, that um, going on. I think this puts us either first or second in terms of the of the number of paired exchanges in the NKR, so it's, we're, it's really, that, the whole National Kidney Registry has worked very well for us. Any questions? Okay. Flavio? Okay. So uh, the title of my talk may be too much of an ambitious title, The Balance Between Efficacy and Toxicity strategies with current and emerging immunosuppressive agents to improve long-term outcome. And I, I uh, you know, we're of course in the Napa Valley and you see the grapes behind the title. And uh, this is not unlike what the winemaker like to do with grapes because you like to have that perfect balance in the grape to make great wine, whereby you have a very high concentration of uh, sugar and also some concentration of uh, acidity. So if the concentration goes too much one way, it's a sweet wine. If it goes too much the other way, it doesn't taste that great. And so uh, similar to the approach to immunosuppression, you need to find a good balance between uh, efficacy and uh, toxicity. Now, this is one of uh, my recent favorite slides. A and this is a slide that keeps us honest and tells us the important issue in transplantation and this is an outcome uh, 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 data slide from the registry run by Dr. Gerhard Opels. 
And this shows a five-year graph survival of 52,000 patients treated with different protocols. So you can see TAC, isothioprine, TAC, uh, MPA, uh, cyclosporin, isothioprine, and cyclosporin MPA, which is mycophenolate mofetil or myfortic now and so on. And you can see that at five years, the graph survival is the same no matter what a regimen they used. Now, if you come on rounds or, you know, you travel around the world or you, in terms of visiting other transplant centers or you go to transplant conferences, there are always people who have a concoction of strategies. We do this, we do that, and our outcomes are great because what we use only this induction and this regimen. At the end of the day, though, when you have 50,000 patients, uh, and, and, and these are corrected for, uh, you know, multiple variables and so on. When you have that data, that it, it strikes you that longer term, we still have not improved graph survival. Now, we have improved graph survival a lot at one year. We certainly have reduced rejection. But beyond one year, uh, uh, the relative risk of graft loss hasn't really changed. And, and I don't think there is an easy answer as to why. Uh, and I think if we see the, uh, in this pie chart or uh, pie graph, the causes of uh, uh, graft loss, uh, I think it's important to note that about 40% of patients die with a functioning graft, die prematurely, many of them from cardiovascular disease. So, I mean, clearly you can reduce rejection rate to zero, but if there are a lot of pa patients who are dying from cardiovascular disease, that's not going to improve long-term outcome. And then a very important cause of graft loss is what we've referred historically as CAN, chronic allograft nephropathy. Now, this term uh, has lost uh, popularity in the transplantation circles because in, instead of being a generic term or a syndromic term, it was used as a spe specific diagnostic term, which is not. There are many causes that lead to chronic allograft nephropathy. And so nowadays, in terms of uh, classification of histology or causes of graft loss, uh, you encounter in the transplant literature terms like IFTA, interstitial fibrosis and tubular atrophy, or inflammation, or tubulitis. So we are getting much more specific in terms of the histology, trying to better link histology to maybe the pathophysiology or the cause of the graft loss. So, coming back to the theme of the balance between toxicity and efficacy. So, the first question is, are we delivering adequate immunosuppression long-term with CNI-based regimens? Uh, in other words, we know that we deliver great immunosuppression at the beginning because our rejection rates are very low. But are we able to maintain this efficacy long-term? And there is some data now that suggests no. It's possibly some of it because of our own doing, because of the minimization uh, approaches that we put patients on to, again, reduce their toxicities. The second question, which, you know, will strike you as very bizarre, and I'll show you some data which, uh, you know, uh, details that, is progressive CNI-induced nephrotoxicity really bad? We've always assumed it's bad. But uh, is the outcome data supportive of that? And of course, finally, something that we've all been incorporating in our strategies, are minimization strategies effective? Uh, and I think it all depends, of course, what causes long-term graft loss. So what is the traditional consensus, uh, and still believed by many, and it may be correct, is that we lose kidneys long-term because of progressive nephrotoxicity. And there is no better study than this r report that was published many years ago in New England Journal from Australia, whereby they took 120 patients post-transplant. They were biopsying them four times in the first year, and then once a year follow followed for 12 years. And as you can see at the beginning, there is a more uh, acute rejection here, uh, or borderline rejection. But as time goes by, rejection rates decrease. And what you can see here in this bar graph there is increased evidence of what they read as calcineurin nephrotoxicity. So that by year 10, basically 100% of the patient had, had that. And then when you look at the various 
causes or the various histological manifestation of this nephrotoxicity, you can see that, that you know, uh, the tubular atrophy fibrosis tend to increase and continue. And then as you can see, arterial halinosis, which is again, uh, maybe a hallmark. I mean, I don't want to use anything as characteristic, but certainly uh, very suggestive of uh, CNI toxicity. So we've, we've accepted that this is really not a good thing for the kidneys to, to have. And in fact, based on, th on this and other studies, uh, there have been many strategies to minimize exposure to the CNI, and this is a, a, the biggest study that was undertaken in Europe and the rest of the world, but not in the United States, called the Symphony Trial, where patients were treated with four types of regimen, low-dose TAC, low-dose cyclosporin, full-dose cyclosporin, and this is a CNI-free regimen consisting of low-dose serolimus with MMF. And as you can see here from the rejection rates, the most effective was low-dose TAC. The least effective was uh, serolimus. And in the first year after transplant, uh, the glomerular filtration rate of the group on low TAC actually seemed to have the best GFR. But then you go to three years and look at the GFR of patients who are on treatment, you can see, first of all, they're all getting to be the same. And in fact, the group that had the highest rejection rate, the serolimus group, had in fact the, the best GFR. Uh, so even by three years, we started losing some of the advantages of, the, uh, of what we thought at the beginning was a, good re a great regimen. Uh, the other, of course, approach that has gained uh, a lot of popularity is steroid withdrawal. And this is a nice study that was uh, uh, reported in 2009 on looking at registry data. And in this registry data, uh, the, the patients were categorized whether one, they left the hospital on steroids or they were withdrawn from steroids, and how many of them had to be reinstated on steroids for one reason or the other, frequently because of rejection or intolerance. And if you see that uh, the uh, the rate of patients leaving the hospital of steroids is it's over, it's about 35%. So one of three patients leaving the hospital these days is withdrawn from steroids. Frequently these protocols are that you withdraw steroids at day five. But then you look at six months and you can see now that about maybe close to 20% will be restarted by six months on steroids. And if you look at 12 months, a higher percentage of those patients are restarted on steroids. So the question that this uh, investigator posed was that, what is the outcome of patients who were off steroids, on steroids from the beginning, or had to be reinstated on steroids? And I think they, their finding is surprising, that if you are on steroids or off steroids and you are, continue to be off steroids, you have best graft survival. But in fact, if you are off steroids and the steroids have to be reinstated for any reason, your graft survival is significantly lower. Not by a lot, but you know, about two to three percentage points, but because of the number of patients, this is statistically significant. Uh, so this raises a question about are steroid withdrawal uh, good regimens? Uh, there is, of course, an increase in rejection rate. On the other side of the coin, there could be some metabolic benefits or cardiovascular benefits, but I think the risks and benefits have to be very well measured or balanced in any specific individual. And basically, this is the conclusion of the study that uh, a good number of patients, about 34% uh, at the end of the year, are restarted on steroids, and that these patients who are off steroids and require steroids tend to do worse. So why kidneys fail in the long term? So now, with the newer uh, literature and outcome data, there appears to be a tilt towards more of a chronic alloimmune response, maybe humoral, versus CNI tox nephrotoxicity. And this is a study uh, that was published by Bob Gaston. This is a group of, of many um, institutions that got together uh, in a study called the DCAF to look at causes of long-term graft failure. And so uh, this is uh, the first cohort of patients that was examined. These are 173 subjects transplanted from uh, before October 2005. So these patients had had a good transplant for many years, on average seven years. 
and had a baseline creatinine of 1.4 before January 1st, 2006. So we would consider that this patient had good function up to January 2006. So this is where prospectively the study starts. Beyond 2006, if patients had an increase in creatinine and underwent kidney biopsy, they were enrolled in the study to find the causes of kidney biopsy. So the first surprise is the following. So after the biopsy, they followed these patients to see their graph survival. And what they found was that patients who were locally diagnosed by their own pathologist as having CNI toxicity in the kidney had better graph survival than those who did not. So of course, superficially, this would suggest that nephrotoxicity is good for the kidney. It let it you know, function for a longer period of time. Of course, the reason behind that is not that. It is that if you give a lot of CNI to suppress the immune system to a such a degree that you produce nephrotoxicity, your kidney may last longer. So this is sort of indirect evidence that more is better, even at the cost or the risk of nephrotoxicity. And then what they did uh, on biopsy, they looked at uh, whether there was evidence of antibody-mediated rejection. And there are two, two sorts of evidence you find. One, whether C4D, C4D, complement C4D, is deposited in the kidney. And this has been proven from several studies to be a good marker that has been a uh, antibody-mediated rejection or antibody that triggered complement and bound to the kidney. And we accept that over 90% of patients who have C4D in the kidney are probably are likely to have had an antibody-mediated rejection. Or we look in circulation to find whether the patient has donor-specific antibodies, and nowadays this is made much easier by the single antigen assays that we have that we can determine exactly if the patient has a DSA. So what they found, in fact, that 43% of patients had neither, no, no C4D and no donor-specific antibody, and their outcome was best. But increasingly, as patients had either only antibody or only C4D or C4D and antibody, that their outcome was getting progressively worse. But importantly, that you know, a good number, almost a majority of these patients, had, um, had evidence of antibody-mediated rejection. So all of a sudden, the conclusion from this study is not cyclosporin or CNI nephrotoxicity is the main cause of, chron of chronic graft loss, but that it may be chronic alloimmune injury, and at least in this studies, suggesting that it was uh, the, uh, it was, oh, going back here, that it was uh, antibody-mediated rejection. Oh, sorry, I'm supposed to go forward, okay. So uh, what to do then, uh, and this is another study which basically uh, complements a tiny bit the previous one. Uh, this is a nice study from the Mayo Clinic whereby uh, the Mayo Clinic wanted to study various histological abnormalities in patients that were at very low risk of immunologic uh, graft loss. These are 151 patients who had living donor transplant who were not sensitized, who did not have rejection, who were biopsied at one year, and they wanted to correlate outcome with what they found at one year. And what they found that uh, patients with normal biopsy, and these were the great majority, subsequently had excellent graft survival. The second group that had almost as good survival, and these were about 30% of patients, were those who had IF, interstitial fibrosis, only interstitial fibrosis, no inflammation. And those patients did as well. The only group that seemed to deteriorate in terms of graft survival were patients who had interstitial fibrosis and inflammation. So all of a sudden, and this is not rejection, by BAMF, if we see inflammatory cells in the interstitium, we don't call it a rejection. Rejection is when the inflammatory cells cross the tubular base membrane and are present in the tubular epithelium, and then we say tubulitis, and that's rejection. So here, for the first time, inflammation in the context of fibrosis was thought to be an important marker of progression. Now, all of us have looked at native kidney biopsies, and in fact, our own pathologists for a long time, in reviewing kidney transplant biopsies, 
they would look at the biopsy and say, well, if there is interstitial inflammation in the context in areas of fibrosis or glomerular atrophy, they, we frequently were, we, used, we used to regard those as not important. Well, disregard that, that's not important because it's in the areas of fibrosis. Well, it turns out that maybe these are important areas and that this is a marker of chronic autoimmune injury. And so, uh, uh, as you'll hear later on, we have a, a presentation on uh, protocol or management biopsy that we do at six months. And we do find a lot of patients with this interstitial fibrosis with inflammation. Again, as I said at the beginning, we haven't seen an improvement in long-term outcome. Maybe many reasons for that. It's possible that this type of abnormality that we used to think was benign and unimportant uh, maybe is important and maybe it should be treated. And as you can see here, the course of GFR from biopsy from one month to whatever, you know, 48 months, normal and fibrosis only, they do well. Those with fibrosis and inflammation, uh, the renal function deteriorates. So now going back to the CNI nephrotoxicity, if you have CNI nephrotoxicity and you have tubular atrophy and interstitial fibrosis, does that mean that the kidney function will remain normal? And only in the context of inflammation does it deteriorate. So I mean, this is quite frankly, it's a whole area where we have to rethink uh, what is the importance of uh, autoimmune injury, fibrosis, CNI-induced nephrotoxicity. Uh, and I think, you know, the next, hopefully the next couple of years, we'll be able to better identify uh, these trends. So where do we go from here? Um, as you saw, the title of my talk was to balance uh, efficacy with uh, uh, toxicity. And so it's clear that we need newer drugs and novel agents. Uh, and I want to talk to you about a, one paradigm shift that's occurring in transplantation, and that's the use of uh, biologic agents for chronic immunosuppression. Now, we all, you all know that we use biologic agents all the time. We use them for induction therapy perioperatively, thymoglobulin, anti-interleukin-2 antibodies, like, uh, for example, uh, basiliximab or Simulect. We used to use the, also Dacluzumab or Xenapax, but that was taken out of the market. Mm -hmm. So uh, the new paradigm of biologics is to use these biologic on a chronic basis. You give the biologics uh, on a, you know, maybe once a month basis, or chronically maintenance therapy, and then you can take away some of the maintenance drugs that are potentially nephrotoxic, and, uh, and therefore you may not require therapeutic drug monitoring, you can improve compliance and so on. And I think there is a, s a number of these biologics that are being developed in the pipeline. But the one that may be around the corner in terms of FDA approval is called Belatazib. And Belatazib is a fusion receptor protein. I think all of you are familiar with it, uh, mo most likely because actually you've had patients that, we have, been that have been treated with Belatazib. We have been using this drug in clinical trials now f uh, for just about 10 years. So Belatazib, a fusion receptor protein, binds to CD86 and CD80. These are two ligands that when they interact with the receptor CD28 on T cells, they activate the T cell. Now this pathway is critical for T cell activation. The T cell uh, requires two signals. The first signal is delivered to their T cell receptor, and that's a allopeptide, but that's not enough to activate the T cell. You require the second signal to fully activate the T cells. So, uh, Belatazib, by binding to these uh, ligands, it interrupts the second signal, and in, uh, at least in vitro and in experimental models, uh, you prevent activation of T cells and rejection. And after the phase two trial that we published many years ago, uh, uh, Bristol Meyer uh, uh, started two large pivotal trials, one called Benefit, and this trial uh, uh, enrolled patients who received kidneys uh, from standard criteria deceased donors or living donors. The second trial was dedicated for enrollment of patients who receive kidneys from extended criteria donors. Just to know whether if, if kidneys already are suboptimal or have fibrosis or some glomerular sclerosis, do they still benefit uh, from this drug? And the protocol of, of both of these trials was the same. There were two arms. Uh, one, uh, uh, two arms treat using uh, be Belatazib, 
and one arm, of course, cyclosporin, the competitor arm. So Belatacep uh, arms were CNI free, no cyclosporin here. All three groups were maintained on similar adjunct therapy with MMF and prednisone. Big difference uh, between the more intense regimen and the lower intensity. I mean, he, the study was also designated to find which is the better and which is the safer regimen. The biggest difference between these two regimen occurred between months one and month six. The patients on more intense regimen received twice as much belatacep as those on the lower intensity regimen. But beyond six months, both patients, both groups, received the same dosage, five milligram per kilo every month thereafter. And now we have patients in the study that, uh, you know, they're followed for, you know, over four years. But we recently presented the data at the uh, uh, transplant meeting, and this is the three-year data. The first year data was already published. And I think this is a, a most interesting part of the presentation. Uh, we uh, initially, in the first year, we analyzed the glomerular filtration rate between the belatacept patients and cyclosporin. And the belatacept treated patients from the very early on after transplantation had significantly better glomerular filtration rate. And the separation between the two was about 15 ml per minute. At year two, this separation increased to 17 ml per minute. And at year three, it increased to 20 ml per minute. So patients who are CNI free treated with belatacept continue to have an improvement in renal function, while the group treated with cyclosporin, as you can see, there is a slow deterioration. As importantly is the, uh, as importantly is the slope. As expected in, in all the CNI, the GFR slope with time deteriorates because you're losing on, the, on average two ml per minute per year. On the other hand, with the two Bellata subgroups, you can see that the slope is positive. So, I mean, at three years, you're starting with a higher GFR with a positive slope. You can easily extrapolate that those kidneys are likely to last longer. And I'll show you one slide that suggests that. And this is time to a GFR below 30 or graft loss or death. And you can see that a greater proportion of patients treated with cyclosporin have reached this endpoint as compared to the two uh, Belatacep patients. And again, these patients underwent protocol biopsies at 12 months and the patients on Belatacep had lower fibrosis and tubular atrophy or CAN than patients treated with cyclosporin. Let's go to the slide. Uh, one of the important uh, causes of graft loss, as I showed you in the decaf, is the development of donor-specific antibodies. And in other studies, patients who develop donor-specific antibody over a subs as compared to patients who don't develop de novo after transplantation donor-specific antibodies, have a two and a half fold increase in graft loss the subsequent year. And as you can see here, if you look at uh, patients in, the, in this study, that very few patients develop uh, donor-specific antibodies with belatacep as compared to uh, cyclosporin. Now, uh, uh, this is a, uh, a, um, a risk predictive uh, model uh, based on the lower intensity regimen of belatacep and, cy and cyclosporin. And this regimen takes in consideration the fact that, in, and I've showed this in previous years, that these patients, the belatacep patients, in the first year have higher rejection rate than patients on cyclosporin, but have higher GFR. Taking these into account, it projects uh, a graft half-life that belatacep uh, produces a graft half-life increase of two years as compared to cyclosporin. This, of course, doesn't take into account two other factors. One, that the GFR may continue to improve beyond three years. And the fact that the patients on belatacep have a lower uh, frequency of donor-specific antibodies, which may benefit them longer term. And so uh, uh, this is an example of potentially what can be achieved uh, with the newer agents, and for example, uh, as an example, belatacep. This is a study that actually is ambitious. Uh, not only it, it, it eliminates CNI, but it also, by using with belatacep, it eliminates uh, prednisone. And in this study, patients were treated now with a short induction with thymoglobulin and two arms of belatacep versus tacrolimus, and uh, they were maintained either on serolimus or MMF, but all three groups of patients were withdrawn from prednisone at day five 
And of course, the belatacept arms did not have tacrolimus. They were CNI free. And again, rejection rates in the three groups were quite low. And GFR in the two bela pa uh, belatacept treated patients were better than those treated with tacrolimus. And uh, while the patients treated with tacrolimus, over 90% were steroid free at one year. Three quarters of the patients on belatacep were free of steroid, but again, you have to remember that these groups were also free of CNI. Uh, finally, uh, at UCSF, we've done several studies with belatacep, but ultimately, I think the agent that will succeed the most is one that will be administered in monotherapy. And this is a patient that was in a immune tolerance network study where we started with an anti-IL-2 antibody, steroids for four days, and uh, at given uh, the, we treated the patients with belatacep and serolimus. At one year, uh, we did a biopsy of the patient, and the biopsy was normal, so we stopped serolimus. So the patient now has been, now this is six months later, uh, the patient has been, you know, two and a half years or so now on just monotherapy with uh, belatacep. So this patient comes once a month, gets the IV uh, administration of belatacep, and that's it. And so this is a model not only for this drug, for, but for other drugs uh, that optimally, if we could simplify the immunosuppression and provide a little toxicity, it would be great. Now, uh, of course, uh, there is no free lunch, uh, and I'll come to that in a second. Uh, these are the cardiovascular risk factors. As I said, that a good number of patients die of cardiovascular disease. With this drug, with belatacep, there is less new onset diabetes in these patients. The blood pressure of patients treated with bela, both systolic and diastolic, were lower than cyclosporin, and there was a more favorable uh, lipid profile. Uh, the, the problem is, during the first year especially, uh, there was a higher rate of uh, post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorders in the patients treated with PTLD. And many of these PTLD were, in fact, CNS, in the, in the CNS, and many of them actually fatal. Most of them occur, though, in patients who were EBV negative serologically at the beginning. And so, uh, and there were more in the more intense regimen. So the more intense regimen, when compared to the lower intensity regimen, did not provide more efficacy. In, in fact, in some instances, less, and provided uh, more side effects, especially, you know, infectious and PTLD. So uh, the recommendations are going to be that patients who are known to be EBV positive can be treated with uh, belatacep, uh, and that the lower intensity regimen, which uh, provided uh, uh, adequate efficacy and was uh, safe in terms of PTLD and infectious complication, would be the, the recommended regimen. As I said, this drug is still awaiting FDA approval. Uh, FDA will have up to May 15 to either approve or not approve the drug. Uh, and so, you know, we hope to have a new drug in transplantation. The last drug that was approved was in the late 90s, so it's time to have a, a novel drug that will give us a tiny bit more flexibility. I, didn't, uh, I don't have time, but there is a study that was also published uh, uh, converting patients from CNI to belatacep, and the conversion at two years appeared to be associated with a little risk of rejection an improvement in glomerular filtration rate from conversion from CNI to belatacep of about 8 ml per minute. And so it's possible in the future that if we have patients that cannot tolerate the drug, uh, that cannot uh, tolerate CNI or have HUS or may develop severe new onset diabetes mellitus, that this would be a uh, potential alternative to convert them from CNI to uh, belatacep. Now, because this is a monthly infusion, and at some point the number of patients will be such, I think the communication between us and you is very important uh, because it's possible, likely, and pretty safe that this drug can be administered everywhere. Uh, in, in our studies, we had patients who had this administration of this drug at home. Uh, so uh, many of you are interested, longer term, it will be great to you know, transit the infusions of these patients to you all. So finally, a few words about another drug uh, that we have used in clinical trial. I won't say a whole lot about it, uh, but this is called tofacitinib. They always give them difficult names, I think. Tofacitinib is a JAG3 inhibitor, 
And what is JAK3? JAK3 is a, a cytoplasmic tyrosine kinase, which is linked to the gamma chain of cytokine receptor. And this is extremely important in uh, downstream signaling of the signals from the cytokine receptor to initiate uh, transcription of cytokines. And it, it, uh, the JAK3 and the gamma chains are important in all these cytokines. These are cytokines that activate T and B cells. We know that this pathway is non, a non-redundant pathway because individuals who are born with mutation of JAK3 or the gamma chain develop severe combined immunodeficiency. So tofacitinib uh, blocks this pathway and should be a pretty potent immunosuppressive agent. And so we participated in this trial whereby patients received a, a, again, a more intense regimen of tofacitinib, a less intense regimen versus cyclosporin. This is very similar to belatacib. The three groups were treated with MMF and prednisone. And in this study, we found that the tofacitinib reduced uh, rejection rate uh, to a comparable degree to cyclosporin. And because, again, these groups are treated with a CNI-free regimen, their glomerular filtration rate uh, measured at 6 and 12 months was significantly better than cyclosporin. And again, on biopsy, they had less chronic allograft uh, nephropathy. Now, this drug, uh, it's not clear now whether this drug is, this was a big phase 3 trial. So we don't know yet whether this drug is going to go to a phase 3. Uh, Pfizer is developing the drug for rheumatoid arthritis. There is a possibility that within a year or less, this drug could be available on the market for patients with RA. So even though it may not make it to transplantation or it may not be developed for transplantation, it may become available and may give transplant physicians yet another choice if they want to uh, stay away from CNI for one reason or the other. So in conclusion, late allograft failure is driven by both alloimmune injury and nephrotoxicity. CNI and steroid minimization strategies have failed to improve outcomes. Novel immunosuppression agents that preserve renal function and can maintain inhibition of early immune response long term with, left, with less toxicities will result, hopefully, in improved long term graft survival. Thank you for your attention. Uh, <clears throat> I'd be happy to answer any questions if you, may ha if you have. Go ahead. Uh, well, uh, <laughs> overall, the incidence of BK was not higher, uh, but you know, when you, need, when you do a clinical trial with an uh, experimental drug, uh, you always, if, there is, if you encounter a complication that you think, I mean, you know, BK infections are very common with the CNI, uh, or the patient did not want to come back for the infusion. I mean, there may be many reasons why specifically we converted uh, uh, that, that patient. Uh, but Overall, uh, in the study, in, in, in the Bellata septic patient, there wasn't a significant increase uh, in BK infection. Yes? Uh, you have to be careful how much you can extrapolate from registry data, because uh, the top line data is pretty accurate, very good. Be you know, death loss of graft, PTLDs. But when you start looking at these other factors, uh, the data may be incomplete. I mean, the, there wasn't much more in, the, in, in, in this uh, study about you know, various other variables in terms of infections and side effects and so on. Now, I did not want to imply that if you give azathioprine, you're, uh, you're going to do as well as MMF although some other people have implied. I mean, Remutzi has published a trial in The Lancet where he got even similar rejection rates. But I think, and you know, Steve Tomlanovic was our primary investigator in the MMF trials. I mean, the MMF trials were pretty convincing that if you use them, um, if you use MMF instead of ASA, that your rejection rates are lower. And I don't think this, that first slide suggested that the rejection rates were comparable. What that slide suggested that despite the rejection rate, the outcome was not different. Uh, and so, I mean, and then we know that from the 1990s when we introduced all the newer immunosuppressive agents going forward, the relative risk of late graft loss did not change much. And so 
the message is that it's not that acute rejection is not important. It is important. It is a risk factor for the graft. But that beyond acute rejection, there are so many other variables that are also important. So if you only reduce acute rejection, and you know nowadays you can, re you can reduce your rejection rate to zero, almost, pretty close. But then you get BK, which you cannot treat. You get all kinds of things. And so, you know, the, my, the whole theme of my talk is that you have to achieve that balance between you know, getting your rejections down, but at the same time, providing an environment for the kidney <laughs> to last a long time, uh, you know, whether having the patient survive because of lack of cardiovascular risk factors or because you, know, you have less disease in the kidney, whether chronic autoimmune responses or, or nephrotoxicity. Good afternoon. We better get going. Uh, well, first of all, on behalf of uh, all my colleagues at uh, UCSF, I'd like to welcome you to our annual conference uh, on transplantation uh, in the beautiful uh, Napa Valley. Uh, I think in view of the complexity of uh, immunosuppressive uh, regimens, I think this type of conference uh, is very important, in particular in, in terms of uh, streamlining uh, the continuity of follow-up between us. Uh, uh, coordinators are uh, Marilyn and uh, Jessica, and you can introduce yourselves to them. Uh, Amy is in, uh, usually comes every year, but she was fortunate enough to go off to Italy and have a really nice time, better than nap, I guess. Uh, Melissa and Martha, uh, are in charge of both post and, and pre-transplant -clinic, pre clinic respectively. We have our social workers, uh, Steve, Andrea, Julia, and, and Laura and Julie, and the financial counselors, uh, <coughs> Curtis, Roberto, uh, Rachel, <coughs> um, Lisa, Ann, Riley, and Regina, and just tell you how complex that the finances of kidney transplantation we got when we have to have almost as many financial counselors as we have nurse coordinators. One of the things we're really happy about is the Connie Frank Transplant Center. It's on the seventh floor. If you'd ever visited a transplant clinic before, it was on the third floor. We had a donor, Connie, who uh, renovated this space for us, and it's really spectacular. It, it did a, the architects changed sort of the standard of um, configuring this because they do such a great job every year. Really is a spectacular thing how they get the weather right. <laughs> so I just also like to thank some of our other sponsors: Novartis, Genentech, uh, Bristol Myers Squibb, Astellas, Amgen, Genzyme, Pfizer, Questcor, Otsuka, and uh, Silex for their uh, continued support of the uh, program. And, <clears throat> and so I hope you'll visit their uh, tables outside. So we have had a pretty stable group now. Um, at least the surgeons have been very stable. We, we're all old and getting older. Nobody has left, and, and uh, we haven't pushed anybody overboard. Everybody seems to be pretty happy with being a UCSF. <coughs> As you know, Steve and Flavio have been here forever. Um, <coughs> and uh, Brian Lee, uh, Allison Weber, and David 
Wojcicki are our newest colleagues, and I think you've probably met um, them maybe this year or last year, but if you haven't, you ought to introduce themselves. They're all great young uh, people with a lot of energy and enthusiasm. <coughs> In terms of our pre-transplant coordinators, <coughs> you know, we sort of break the coordinators out in areas of expertise. So we have our deceased donor uh, coordinators, Teresa, David, Linda, and, and uh, Maria Tong. Uh, in terms of the living donor coordinators, um, we have uh, Kelly, who just uh, joined us, uh, Diane, uh, <coughs> Sarah, and uh, Janine has moved over from uh, deceased donor to the living donor um, group. Uh, for evaluation, so when your patients first come to UCSF, they either meet uh, Sandra or Stephanie, and those that go to the outreach uh, clinics, um, Myra and Kelly are going to be their guides uh, to transplantation. In terms of the post-transplant clinic, uh, <coughs> Melanie and Brooke. Uh, <coughs> Brooke just joined us uh, recently. Uh, Sue Robertson, who is in the post-transplant clini clinic, has moved over as a nurse practitioner in the inpatient side of things and joining Nancy Fong Ham, who's been doing a great job there. Uh, for pancreas, we have uh, Sally and the pediatric. Um, <coughs> and you, the physicians of the patient. And basically, ultimately, uh, to make sure compliance of the drugs is there and we can hopefully, in many ways, improve long-term outcomes. And this is the subject of going to be of many presentation, basically, how can we finally improve long-term outcome in transplantation? We have a very nice uh, program today, and uh, hopefully you'll find it both instructive and enjoyable. <coughs> uh, so without any undue delay, I'd like to introduce our Chief of Service, John Roberts, who every year gives you a state of, the transpa of transplantation at UCSF and our outcome data. Well, good afternoon. It's nice to see a great turnout again. <coughs> um, first off, you know, I think we all owe uh, Flavio and more importantly, Peggy Malara a hand in uh, organizing.